guys, welcome to this segment of Crafting and Crying with Charlie. So the project I'm going to be working on today is actually a project that I had already finished. Um, we needed to get a microphone linked out for a project um, at our soundstage, you know, Beantown Studios at Beantown Stadium Production Company. And I noticed after a couple of uses, some of the stones were falling off. And then I realized that I had forgotten a step. Anytime you're stoning on smooth plastic, it's always a good idea to sand it down either with a nail file or very fine sandpaper, which allows the glue to adhere better to the stone and to the plastic so they don't fall off. Lesson learned. So that's what I'm going to be working on today. I'm using this crystal glaze, which is really awesome. Um, Crown Crystals is the one that creates it. And it's, it's very heavy duty and it doesn't smell like other glues. So, and um, it actually dries fairly quickly. And then uh, I'm just using AB crystals that we had from before. So the story I'm going to talk to you guys about today is the Coconut Grove Fire that happened in Boston, Massachusetts, November 28, 1942. Now the Coconut Grove Club now, clubs weren't allowed in Boston, in Massachusetts, like the clubs we know now. They're actually called supper clubs. Now, the Coconut Grove Supper Club had been very popular in the 1920s during Prohibition. And then the, the popularity of it kind of died down in the 30s. Now, the club was originally owned by a gangster boss named Solomon. His last name was Solomon, and his nickname was King Solomon. And he actually wind up getting um, taken out during a, a gangland uh, shooting in 1933, and his attorney, Barney Walensky, wound up taking over. Now, Barney was able to turn a profit in this club, and the reason was because he was really shady. Like, he literally used unlicensed electricians, he used subpar material, he hired underaged um, staffing, you know, employees that wouldn't help him cut cost at all areas. He actually bragged about the fact that he didn't need a, um, he didn't need to follow the codes because he was very good friends with the mayor of Boston. So he just basically thought he could do whatever he wanted. So that particular day, there had been a football game at Fenway Park and there had been some um, AS scouts there who had come out to watch BC play because they were going to extend an invitation to them to play either in the Sugar Bowl or the Cotton Bowl. Any football fan, college football fan, knows that that's a huge deal. <laughs> um, unfortunately for BC, they were playing against Holy Cross, and Holy Cross beat them in a huge upset. Yeah, Holy Cross wound up winning 55-12. to Yeah, about that. So... BC had planned this huge celebratory dinner at the Coconut Grove Club, Supper Club, and they wind up canceling. Obviously, there was no joy in Mudville that night. But you have to remember, this was 1942. So there was still GIs, sailors, you know, home for leave, or, you know, they just happened to have a shore call. So, you know, the club was fairly busy. Now, talking about Bernie being shady, the fire department had given him a permit for 460 patrons. Well, that night there were over a thousand. Goes to show you how he thought he was immune to the law. And the way the layout was, there was the lower level lounge, which was called the Melody Lounge. And then you had um, the stairways going up and then you had the first floor, which was the main floor. And it had these elaborate, you know, fake coconut trees and they had, you know, like the hut material, the wicker and all of that to give it this South Sea kind of vibe, the tropical vibe. Now, and they also had a second floor, but I don't know really what they had in there. Maybe it was storage or whatever. So also that particular day, there had been a very well-known actor named Buck Jones. Now, Buck Jones was in the genre kind of like, um, let me think. Gene Audrey, Roy Rogers, you know, Lone Ranger kind of thing. He was very popular with the kids. 
So that day, early in the day, he had been at Children's Hospital visiting sick kids to, you know, cheer them up and stuff. Now, there were some agents that wanted him to come to the club, you know, to be seen, and they wanted to talk business with him. And he really didn't feel up to it. He wasn't feeling well. Um, he was under the weather, and he just wanted to go back to his hotel and kind of relax. But, you know, being a dutiful man, he's like, all right, I'll go. I'll hang out for a little bit and then I'll just go back to my hotel. So he was there. Now, shortly before 10 p.m., the show was about to start. People were waiting around for it. And then the bartender on the lower level lounge winds up noticing that there is a light out. And the speculation was that someone had unscrewed it either as a joke or to be able to have more intimacy with their date. So he tells, you know, the 16-year-old busboy to go change it. So the busboy, you know, he grabs a chair and he goes over there and he realizes, wow, it is really dark here. I can't see anything. So he winds up lighting a match so that he can see. So while he's screwing the light bulb back in when he realized it was loose, the match inadvertently touched one of the leaves for the fake coconut tree now they were made out of like this paper mache kind of material and they were covered in wax to protect them from dust and from wear and tear so what wind up happening is when the match touched it it didn't instantly catch fire it was kind of like a glow and then it kind of spread and I'm assuming when the wax melted and the paper hit that's when it burst into flames so the bartender notices this so he goes over there and he's trying to put the fire out with you know, water or seltzer water. I mean, he tried several things, but it didn't work. So now people are yelling fire and people panic. Um, so now to get out of that lower level lounge, there's only these narrow steps. That's the only way out, except for the emergency exits. So now people are running up these stairs and they're kind of getting wedged because they're very narrow and they're just panicking, trying to get out. And it kind of slows everybody down because now the, the stairs are jammed. So then now people are looking for the emergency exits and come to find out they weren't clearly marked. They were locked from the inside and some of them were even covered with fabric and they were covered with, you know, there was stuff in front of them. So people didn't know where to find them. So they actually got one of them open and sadly what wind up happening is the doors opened in. So now when the person was able to open it, they're trying to get out and there's a press of people uh, behind them so the door winds up getting wedged closed and these people just get pressed in there and unfortunately um, they wind up getting stuck there and perishing which was horrible now the people that go upstairs they go to the first floor and the only way out of that building was a revolving door so now all these people are trying to get out through this revolving door and again, because of the press of people, it wind up getting jammed. So now these people were stuck. They could not get out. I cannot imagine being on the outside, seeing my loved ones or my date, my husband, my family, because that's what was there, not being able to get out and basically perishing in front of me. Now, just by a coincidence, someone had hit a firebox two blocks away from the Coconut Grove building. And the, fire, the Boston Fire Department responded, and when they got there, they realized there was a car on fire. So they quickly put the car fire out, and then as they were getting ready to leave, one of the firemen looked up and noticed there was smoke coming out of the Coconut Grove, Grove building, so they went over there and responded. Now, one of the lieutenants, when he realized the magnitude of what was going on, he you know, called in a second alarm, and the captain's like, no, let's just go to a third alarm because we really need a lot of help here. The sad part about it was that the fire department had the fire out very quick, fairly quickly. I mean, within an hour, the fire was out. But then they realized the magnitude of what the recovery, rescue, and um, retrieval was going to be like. So they actually put a call out to anybody in the armed forces, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, whoever happened to be around to come out and help, because now they realized that they had to go in there and retrieve and recover these bodies, because at this point they were trying to have a rescue as well, because they didn't know who was still alive in there. So now once they get in, they are able to actually get in, and they are swamped with people. So they wind up, at that time, there was Boston City Hospital, 
and there was Mass General Hospital. So they literally sent over 400 patients, victims, to Boston City Hospital. And Boston City Hospital, they were swamped. They were getting like a, a patient every 11 seconds. So they wind up calling anybody that they could to come in and help them out. And, you know, Mass General Hospital, they wind up getting 116 victims. Now, interestingly, what they had to do was that the people that, the victims that they thought had already perished in the fire, they instantly took them to the morgue. Unfortunately, what wind up happening is that some of the victims that were taken to the morgue were still alive. Um, luckily, you know, some of them were found that they were alive and they were able to take it to the hospital and they, some of them did wind up surviving. Now, another interesting thing that came out of this was the fact that when they were taken to the hospital, you have this massive amount of patients. So Boston City Hospital treated the burn victims the way they normally would, you know, with the, the acids that they used and just continue to march. Whereas Mass General Hospital used a new system. They used, you know, the petroleum jelly, the gauze, the skin grafts. And what wind up coming out of that was that the majority of the people that had the severe burns at Mass General Hospital wind up surviving. And Boston City Hospital actually had a higher rate of burn patients die from infections. Um, so that technology that came out of uh, Mass General using that resulted in them being able to use that for soldiers that were hurt in battle. So now they're realizing the recovery is massive. So, you know, through the night they go and get the rescue. Now, like anything else, now people want heads to roll. They're like, you, you know, something happened. We need to make sure that somebody gets punished for it. So originally everybody wanted the poor busboy's head on a platter. You know, he had to go before the sessions that they were having to get information and you know he had to testify over and over again and the poor kid was like getting death threats and that's why I'm not even mentioning his name even though he passed away I don't feel that he deserved that and I mean this poor 16 year old kid but ultimately it came down to the owner uh, Barney Walensky now ironically while all these people were being taken to the emergency room at Mass General Hospital Walensky was on the third floor recovering from a heart attack that he had had 12 days earlier ironic I know so he actually wind up getting indicted um, on 19 counts of manslaughter how they came up with those counts I don't really know I don't know if it was a result of the code violations because, oh, and one of the other things that happened that um, people don't realize was that with the material that was in there, the, you know, the stuffing, the furniture covering, the shears that they had hanging, the, the oils and chemicals in all those fake plants, there, that was a toxic cocktail that wind up coming in there. And that actually resulted in a lot of people dying. Um, sadly, some of the people from the fumes literally passed away at their table with their drinks. That, that just blows my mind how quickly that happened. And sadly, as a result of that, more patients died from the result of having um, edema in their lungs, which is a buildup of fluid, which was as a result of um, lung damage from all the chemicals and a lot of them that's what they wind up passing away from you know they would put them in the oxygen tanks and all of this stuff so the newspaper the following day announced that there was 400 people that had perished um sadly that number climbed to like 490 because of the result of all the people that wind up dying in the hospital after the fact and like I said a lot of them died from the respiratory issues and sadly Buck Jones the actor he actually was alive for two days but perished in the, at the hospital so like I was saying uh, the owner Barney he got indicted on 19 counts of manslaughter and the mayor of Boston actually um, just narrowly averted getting indicted as well so he went to trial Barney did, and then they found him guilty. And he wind up getting sentenced to 12 to 15 years. Now, at this time, he was like 50 years old. And um, unfortunately, three and a half years later, 
the governor of Massachusetts actually wind up commuting his sentence after he had served those three and a half years because he had stage N cancer. And um, they wind up releasing him and he died. You know, some say five months, some say 12 weeks, some say a couple of weeks. But fairly sh shortly after he was released, he did pass away. Uh, now, the only good thing that came out of this was that there was a lot of safety standards that were changed and updated as a result of this. Now, one of the things that for a long time, it was illegal to have revolving doors in any establishment that had a high number of patrons. Now, obviously, that's changed because we have revolving doors now. But if you notice, they're required to have either one or two doors on either side that push that people can get out. Uh, the other thing that came out of this was that emergency exits have to be clearly marked and clear of any obstructions. That's why we now have the lights or the glow in the dark stickers that you wind up seeing um, anywhere you go. Thirdly, what came out is that doors in establishments that have patrons have to push out. And that's why, if you notice, there's a lot of them that have the crash bar. And they have to be unlocked from the inside. I mean, how you keep people from coming in, that's fine. Because originally, the reason they had them locked was so people couldn't sneak out and not pay their bill. So some of these doors were, like, barred and um, had chains or were locked. And that's what caused so many people to perish. So that was another thing that came out. Because, you know, if, if it's an emergency and people are crushing you, you're still going to get pushed out and be able to get out. Obviously, other things like the type of materials that are used have to be flame retardant and, uh, you know, the electricians have to be licensed. And it's funny, too, though, because one of the things that did wind up happening is the people that were on the first floor, they, there was a, a series of tunnels that were used by the employees to get in and out of the club. And um, some of the employees were actually able to escort a bunch of the guests through these darkened tunnels because the other thing they didn't have was emergency lights. That was another thing that was required because when the fire started, everything went pitch black. So that's why now um, businesses are required to have emergency lights on a separate generator or system that won't be affected if the lights go, the regular lights go out. So they were able to rescue a lot of people going that way. Um, so People look at this case and, and realize how horrific it was. Now, just think about the fact, like I mentioned earlier, had Boston College won, the casualties could have been double or triple because that's how many more people were going to be there. Even though he was only allowed 460 people, I mean, he had a 1,000 there with Boston College. It could have easily been two or 3,000 because they would just pack them in there like sardines. Now, a lot of fire inspectors and uh, firemen have asked the question, could this happen again? And, you know, sadly, even with all the laws and precautions that have been taken, it can and it has. If you guys remember a few years ago, the Warwick, Rhode Island fire that killed 100 people. And then, you know, 9-11. I mean, I know it was a result of the plane crashing, but a lot of the casualties were from the smoke and the fire and just that there was no way out. Um, and that was... It's kind of sad, you know, that after all these years, we, we still have that issue. So the, the location of the original Coconut Grove Club is at 17 Piedmont Street. And actually, there's a Radisson motel, uh, Hotel on that site now. They actually have a plaque, a memorial, uh, pointing out that that was the site of the Coconut Grove Club. All right. So with that, I am done. Hopefully this time they won't decide to kamikaze off the mic. And just again, we used AB crystals. Make sure you sand down the plastic. I personally like crystal glaze just because it works amazing and it, the smell isn't strong. Speaking of chemicals. And, you know, just my little dandy um, wax uh, pen to put everything in there. So... And that is the end of my story, the Coconut Grove story. If you guys are interested in finding out more information, you can actually go to the, let me check, bostonfirehistory.org. They are kind of the keepers of a lot of information pertaining to fires in the history of the fire department and events like that here in, in Massachusetts. Um, and there's been a lot of books and documentaries and stuff done, so if you guys want more information. And with that, end of my craft end of my story and I look forward to seeing you guys again on the next segment of Crafting and Crime with Charlie. Have a great one guys.